Ladies and gentlemen, please stand and turn in your Bibles uh, to that familiar passage by now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. The Bible reads, Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. And by the way, if you give thanks for everything, you will uh, be thanking God without ceasing as well. This is all about three things we ought to do without ceasing. Rejoice without ceasing, pray without ceasing, give thanks without ceasing. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Ladies and gentlemen, at this late hour, by the grace of God, allow me to preach in your hearing a simple message titled, Rejoice, Pray, Give Thanks, Repeat, Part 5, Praying Through the Bible, Message number 340 in this series. Holy Father God, we thank you for your holy word. It has already ministered to the hearts of those who are truly saved and born again and to the hearts of those who want to read and understand your holy word and live by it. Forgive us and cleanse us of our sins. Make us fit for your use, not only the preaching part, but the hearing part, and all of those who are serving right now, making this message go around the world. Crush and crucify our flesh and the old man within us, and fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Save those who are lost, and revive those who are saved, and rebuke and bind our enemy, the devil and his demons and his host from every last one of us, and help all of us to be prayerful, sober-minded, vigilant, and watchful. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, We are in a series of messages titled, Praying Through the Bible, a series on every passage, and verse regarding prayer in the Bible. The purpose of this series is to encourage you, to challenge you. To exhort you, and yes, even to motivate you to pray to the God of the Bible, and that's what this is all about. By the way, if you're not doing that, you're not not doing much at all in and with your Christianity. Prayer is where the rubber meets the road. I shared with some people on yesterday that I believe, at least for the preacher, uh, preaching is uh, a great exercise in faith in God. I believe that many people don't preach the gospel. I'm talking about not people called to preach as a pastor or as an evangelist, but we're all called to share the gospel with all people. The main reason why we don't is the main reason why we don't do a whole lot of things. And God uh, put his finger on it a long time ago because we don't believe in God. That's why we don't do a whole lot of things that we should be doing. We don't have faith in God. We, re- we are uh, practical atheists. We don't believe in God. If we believed in God and trusted in God as we should and in His Son Jesus Christ, 
We would do everything they said. It takes faith to preach the gospel. It takes faith to pray. And that's why so many people don't pray. Because they don't have faith in God. So if you're not doing the simple thing called prayer, you're really not doing much of anything in your Christian life and in your so-called church work. No real work can be done for the Lord until you pray. Be that as it may, we have highlighted each of these over 500 verses and passages in the Prayer Motivator Devotional Bible. So far we have completed 339 messages in this series. This is message number 340, titled, Rejoice, Pray, Give Thanks, Repeat, Part 5. Now I'm not going to claim originality on that title. Uh, but I hope that it is original with us because my oldest son, Daniel White the Fourth, helps me with these sermons and he rarely comes up with great titles, but this one I, I love. I love it. It's a sermon in a nutshell. Dr. Adam Clark said, you are dependent on God for every good thing. Without him, you can do nothing. Please understand that, you proud, stubborn, rebellious, what God called his Israelite children, stiff-necked people. Down on the dirt roads of James City, we were called hard-headed. He's just hard-headed. It's the same thing. He goes on to say, feel that dependence at all times. Now, by the way, you can't, you can't work this up. You can't force yourself to feel that dependence. It's got to be in you. You can't fake it. Do you truly depend upon God? Most people in America do not depend upon God. Let's just be honest about it. Now, God is holding us up with his everlasting arms. You, you can rest assured of that. But most of us don't depend upon God. Most Americans, most Christians, yea, most evangelicals don't pray, Lord, bless me today with my daily bread. You know why? Because they went grocery shopping at Sam's and at Costco's. A month ago, and they already have their bread in the deep freezer. At least uh, they have gone down to Walmart and spent $250 so that they don't have to go back to Walmart for a week and a half. We don't depend upon God. We should. But I assure you that God is holding us up. And supplying our every need. Because God does not love like we love. Can somebody say man? I can't get my head around his love. I just don't understand it. It is absolutely amazing. Feel that dependence at all times. And you will always be. He said in the free spirit of prayer. In the spirit of prayer. It's, he's basically saying, automatic. <clears throat> Those who feel this spirit will, as frequently as possible, be found in the exercise of prayer. And if you're not in that spirit of dependence on God, which your pride 
can't stand. Isn't it amazing? We're born through a woman, not knowing anything or anybody, not knowing and or understanding at least where we came from. We didn't understand what was going on and what was said to us or what we were trying to say. And we were put on this ball hanging on nothing. And yet we are so proud and arrogant and stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious. Thinking that we are really somebody, that we got it all under control. Then zip, bam, boom, a storm comes along and knocks us to the ground. And we ain't bad no more. We're very humble and we begin to call on the God that we have, we don't even know, or the God that we have forgotten. I told somebody today, you need to humble down and trust God. Stop trying to be God. You're not. Stop deluding yourself. Stop deceiving yourself. Just humble down and let God do what he's going to do in his time. I told some folks last week while I was preaching, uh, you need to understand that you're going to wait on God. <laughs> oh, my, you impatient people. Oh, yes. You rest assured, my beloved. You're going to wait willingly. Or you're going to wait reluctantly, but you will wait on him. Some of us think that God is not in control of things, that he's up there, you know, the old grandfatherly type that does not know what's going on. He's not aware. No, 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 my dear friend. God is very much aware of what's going on, even in your life. He knows what you're doing. He knows that you're not ready for certain things. And he knows that you know it. And so he's making you wait even though you don't want to wait. It reminds me of a commercial back in the 60s and 70s regarding ketchup. I told my children a long time ago, don't you ever bring any cheap ketchup in my house. It's got to have Heinz or uh, the other one. It's the Hunt's. Well, you know why I'm that way? Because that's what I was raised up on. But there was a commercial. People had a hamburger. They had a french fries. And the song would go like this. And while well, the ketchup was slowly going... It's not, it's a ketchup, it's not supposed to be watery. It's going to take a while to get on out that bottle. While the ketchup was slowly coming out, people having fits of not having patience and waiting for the ketchup. Got the hand on the cheek as universal for I can't wait no longer. And the ketchup is pouring out. And the song writer uh, had the singer sing, Anticipation is making me wait. <laughs> that's where that's where most of the church is today you're mad as fire because God is making you wait now he can show you better than he can tell you evidently that uh, he's in control okay yes that's right he's making you wait you, that, 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 that requires humility that requires meekness that requires prayer uh, that requires many dry days that many people, most people in America, we don't want to do. We just don't want to do that. When am I getting out of here? I don't see any, any movement, God. I might need to take a step myself and make something happen. Because uh, you, God, you're not moving fast enough. Where's my Boaz, Lord? Where's my uh, Ruth, Lord? Well, I've been waiting long enough, and you know you're not ready for Ruth. 
And ma'am, you're not ready for Boaz. You're just not, and you know it. And God knows it better than you. So you might want to go back to your prayer closet and stop all of that uh, big talk. And humble yourself down. God bless your heart and pray for a while and just wait and sit your fast self down. I'm talking to men and women. Always want to move fast and try to make something happen and you know you're not ready. And it's going to blow up in your face and then you got to go not only two steps back but four steps back. I cannot tell you how many hundreds and thousands of folk who burst out from under God's authority and the authority that God has placed upon them and burst out trying to do something ahead of time. Can't wait two months. Can't wait four months. Can't wait four weeks. Can't wait two days. Can't wait on nothing. But I assure you, my beloved, As sure as I'm black and my last name is white, you're going to wait. And the more proud and arrogant you are, the more painful it's going to be. And we're going to see the universal sign of, I can't wait no more. Hand on the cheek. I'm bored. I'm sick and tired of this mess. When is God going to do something? Where is my Boaz? Where is my Ruth? And you couldn't even you couldn't even handle Ruth, and you couldn't you wouldn't know what to do with Boaz. You don't listen to me very carefully, and I'm serious as I can be. There are women today who have come up. They do not. If you ask them, listen to me very carefully. If you ask them to boil an egg for you, they won't know what the world you're talking about. And I assure you, they don't know how to boil an egg because there's a special way to boil an egg. And as soon as their husband turn around or their husband go out, well, yeah, you go on out and be with the boys. Well, let me look on YouTube to find out how to boil an egg before you get back here. Thank God for YouTube. The millennials will need it. Don't even know how to boil an egg. You need to wait for a while and get some training. Go back to Big Mama's house. Girl, you don't know how to boil an egg. How about fried egg? Um, fried egg? I never heard of that before. How about poaching egg? Poach? I, I didn't think no egg on the porch. What are you talking about? You need to, you need to wait. Because that man may want some old style cooking every now and then instead of uh, arugula and uh, uh your little lettuce that you got stringing to them and all that, trying to help, help him eat healthy like you. He may want something else. And you need, to know, you need to know how to do it. You don't want him to throw his hands up in frustration. Man, I miss my mother's cooking. I'm going to die up here. You don't even know how to boil an egg. You might need to wait, honey. Sir, you might need to wait. I'm not through. I'm not through. Don't you worry, young ladies. Most young men today don't know how to change a tire. They don't. They've never done it. They've never heard of any such a thing. You give them a flat tire, and you ask them, where's the lug wrench? And they look at you, the what? The, lug- the luggage? What are you talking about? You might need to wait a while. Because as sure as I am standing before you today, you and your beautiful, sweet thing, you're going to be riding down the road one day in your beautiful car, in your beautiful car. And you're going to have a flat. And you're going to appear less than a man. Because you don't know how to change a tire. Most young men today don't know how to change a tire. They don't even know what you're talking about. You might need to wait, sir, and learn some skills. Let me move on. 
Oh, I'll be here all night. Over the past four weeks, we have talked uh, uh, talked about the importance of rejoicing evermore. And by the way, yes, God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, through uh, salvation through Christ, will fill you with his Holy Spirit and it'll just be in you. But some of you are a little bit challenged and you need to make a choice in your life that you're going to be cheerful, you're going to be joyful, and you're going to depend upon God to be so. Some are on uh, of the melancholy type. They're just bent out of shape all the time. Uh, They're not type A or B or C. They are D, depressed. And you, you, you might, and, and we have some who are feeble-minded. That's just the reality. And you may have to just, by the grace of God, condition yourself and, and train yourself with God's help, with the power of the Holy Spirit to say, you know what, I'm going to be at least pleasant. Because if you're not at least pleasant, you will not get along in a marriage and in a family. Everybody needs to be at least pleasant. Pleasant. One of my psychology psychology teachers told me and repeated. He said, "Now, for you parents, your job is to make your children lovable. That means make them pleasant to be around. Nobody wants to live thirty years with a sourpuss, and nobody." wants to live 30 years, 40 years with somebody, if you ask them anything about news, I don't know. Why you ask me about some mess like that? I don't know. Every day, I don't know. Where's my keys at? I don't know. Got a bad attitude, bad spirit. Where's my food at? I don't know. Where's my money at? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> that's all they say. They have nothing else to talk about. That is not going to work, people. You, If you are a child of God, you can at least be pleasant, even when you get up in the morning and even when you go to bed at night. You don't want to be in a, I don't know, spouse. When are we going to have sex together again? It's been five months. I don't know. Is everybody all right? I don't know. Are you all right? I don't know. (laughs) It's ridiculous. Are the children fine? I don't know. They're your children. You don't know anything. Unpleasant. Got a bad attitude. Those dishes have not been washed in three weeks. You're going to have a serious issue here. I don't know when I get to it. I'll get to it when I can. Why can't you get to it right now? I don't know. <laughs> you can't be that way, people. Ah, uh-uh, no. See, you got these people who put on the dog to get somebody, and then once they get anybody, they become a dog. Excuse me. Mad as fire all the time. Don't even communicate anymore. But you communicated quite a bit when he took you to Piccadilly's years ago. You dressed up and you smell good. Now you stink. Wearing the same clothes over and over again. With child spittle on your dress all day long for weeks. And then you get on the phone and complain with your old girl. From her, he don't even touch me no more. Why not? At least be pleasant, people. And if you are a child of God, rejoice evermore. As Christians, we are called to rejoice despite our circumstances. I cannot emphasize that enough. No matter what your situation is, if you are a child of God, you ought to rejoice in it. Even if you are in jail, like Paul was. We can do that easily when our focus is on the Lord Jesus Christ and not on 
what is going on around us or the predicaments we find ourselves in. You can't do that, my dear friend. You can't focus on what the situation is. You've got to focus on God, on Christ, on prayer, on the Word of God. And guess what? You're going to wait. You're going to have to wait. Anticipation is making me wait. You're going to have to wait. I wish we could just get it over with. No, that's that's the process. And God wants you to go through the process. Now, God can get it over with, uh, but He chooses not to. He wants you to go through a process. My soul, if I knew my teenagers were going to be this hellacious, man, why didn't God just give them to me already at 18? Why do we have to go through this? No, that's what life is about. It's a process. Because while you're raising that child, hopefully for his glory, God is raising you. Breaking you and making you and molding you and making you feel the pain he feels when you disobey him. It's a very humbling experience, but a very good experience. So now tonight, my beloved, in this late night service, and I want to say a a big hello to our dear African brothers and sisters who have never heard me preach at 6 o'clock in the morning their time, 6 something now, 7 o'clock in Great, 6 o'clock in Great Britain, all of our friends there, we thank God for you and France and uh, Norway and Denmark, uh, all across Europe, Russia, Moscow and Kenya and all of these wonderful places. We thank God for you. And uh, maybe we'll do this more as time goes on. Now we turn our attention to verse 17, which says, Pray without ceasing. This, and by the way, if the Lord tarries is coming, we'll be here a while on this passage. Believe it or not, this is one of the most interesting, intriguing, uh, confusing for many people, and controversial verses in the Word of God. Everybody has a viewpoint regarding, uh, an opinion rather, about this passage. And I will share many of them with you as we go on, because I want you to understand uh, that God wants you to do what he said. Pray without ceasing. <clears throat> Regarding this uh, verse, Dr. Albert Barnes said, Pray without ceasing means that we are to be regular and constant in the observance of the stated seasons of prayer. We are to observe the duty of prayer in the closet, in and with the family, and in the assembly convened to call on the name of the Lord. Amen, somebody. He said, we are not to allow this duty to be interrupted by any trifling cause. And a man wrote many years ago a book don't sweat the small stuff. And then he said, all of it is small. Or at least most of it is small. And we get off our prayer track so quickly at the popping up of anything. And that's exactly what the devil designs those popping up events for to distract us from prayer, to keep us from prayer. If you are determined to pray in the morning and you have a regular habit of praying in the morning, I assure you, you're going to have nine, nine things that's going to uh, 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 try to keep you back from that prayer time. So understand that. He goes on to say, we are so to act that it may be said we pray regularly in the closet. 
in the family and at the usual seasons when the church prays to which we belong. It also means we are to maintain an uninterrupted and constant spirit of prayer. We ought to be mindful of prayer. Can somebody say amen? Ask yourself, were you mindful of prayer throughout this day? Did you pray without ceasing this past day? I know we're in the morning time now. Did you? Did you think about prayer? Or is it the case that, as it is with many people, that you didn't think about prayer until you got to Wednesday night prayer meeting? And then you said, hmm, I didn't even pray as I should have. I didn't pray for this service as I should have today. And don't feel bad, folks in the pew. Most preachers don't pray as they should. That's one of the reasons why you're probably catching so much hell and they're catching so much hell because the pastor's not even praying. He's playing just like the people in the pew. That's just reality. That's just a fact. And I know it to be so because they have told me so. You say, preacher, how do you know? Because when I have preached in churches across this country and around the globe, the first sermon I'm going to preach about is prayer. I'm going to preach on this prayer because if we don't have prayer going on, ain't nothing happening. And I know this. And after the sermon, I'm amazed at how many pastors have told me I really am struggling in my prayer life. I don't pray as I should. I, just, I know it. And I thank God for their transparency and their honesty. Because when you know you're not praying as you should, you know it. You know it, and you know it well. We are to be in such a frame of mind as to be ready to pray publicly if requested. And I said this before and I'm going to say it again. Many of us as Christians don't want to pray because we have a pet sin in our lives. A sin that so easily besets us. A sin that we love so much. And the last thing on earth you want to do is pray and you know it. Why? Because you have a boo. You have a boo that you ought not to have. And you and the boo are doing the do. And is evil and is wrong. And you don't want to hear nothing about prayer because God's going to bring up that boo. And what you do with that boo. And you don't like to be disturbed about the evil that you do. With that boo. So beloved. We are to be in such a frame of mind. As to. As to be ready to pray publicly. If, re if requested. Most Christians are not. Are prepared to pray. They start coughing and gagging. As soon as you call on them. And when alone, to improve any moment, watch this, to improve any moment of leisure. How many times you have had a few minutes of leisure, and you're doing something you like to do, and God told you to pray, and you took the time to pray. <clears throat> you might be a prayer warrior. How many of you were, you, 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 you we're getting ready to do something fun and just right quick like God downloaded. Hey, I want, I want you to pray with them before y'all go. Amen, somebody. I want you to pray with your buddies before y'all go and uh, go bowling or go to Starbucks or go to watch a movie together. While you're in the car, I want you to pray. For a safe trip. Because there's. A heat seeking. Devilish missile. Designed to kill you tonight. And your friends. 
and take away four husbands from their wives and take away four fathers from their children. <clears throat> You'll be amazed at how many people get tragically killed just going one mile to Walmart to pick up some milk and sugar. Oftentimes because they did not pray. I I remember this so clearly. Uh, two of my children were in the car, maybe three. We just had to go to Walmart to pick up a few things. And I had this overwhelming burden to pray while we were getting in the car. I said, folks, I said, uh, children, let's pray. And uh, while we were praying, we almost were killed and uh, ushered into glory. It was a bad situation. And I believe that there are many Christians who can give a similar testimony. So even in the moment of leisure, even when you're getting ready to do something fun, God will speak to your heart and the Holy Spirit will say pray. Do I have a witness up in here tonight? Amen, somebody. So even in a moment of leisure which we may have, when we feel ourselves strongly inclined to pray, that's God, dear friend. He, may, he might be doing that because he wants you to remember in your leisure even, you are to glorify his name. Then don't forget me while you're having fun. I appreciate the good work you did over here for me. But while you are having fun, don't. Don't forget me. Because I, I find pleasure in even your leisure. That I afford you. So that Christian. Is in a bad state of mind. Who has suffered. Himself by attention to worldly cares. Or by light conversation. Or by gaiety. And I hope to God you're not gay. But that's not what we're talking about. Just all caught in. The so-called fun stuff of life that you forget God and vanity. We have got to be the most vain people in the history of the world. We're worse than the 1920s. We've got to be. Well, I saw a lady today, may God help her, a white lady. She spent thousands of dollars to look like Princess Megan. And she all, she's a white version of her now. We're just so vain. You're so vain you think this sermon is about you. You're so vain you think the song is about you. And we have a whole lot of folk like this today. <clears throat> And there's about five or six folk who we need to have a vacation from seeing them for at least once a week. Kim Kardashian is one of them. Give us a break. You're so vain. You think this sermon is about you. Sometimes we can read something that's improper or look at something that is improper or by eating too much or by drinking too much and Lord knows I've been guilty of that from time to time I'm doing much better now by the grace of God or by late hours at night among the thoughtless and the vain down at the club 
shuffling your feet, can't dance, so but you can shuffle. To be brought into such a condition that he cannot engage in prayer with proper feelings. That means without sin, without sincerity. You know, you know that proper feelings mean. You know, you're not engaged. You're just saying words. There has been evil done to the soul if it is not prepared for communion with God at all times. And if it would not find pleasure, my God, my God, help us in approaching his holy throne. My family will tell you, they've heard me say thousands of times, that the best time of my day is family devotions. And that's the truth. That does not mean I feel like getting up and oftentimes having prayer devotions for two and three hours. Because I deal with uh, issues during that time as well. We don't wait for the dinner table. We do all of that in the morning. I don't always feel like doing it, but once I get started, I love it. It's the best time of my day, because I know things are going to go a whole lot better because of that time. And so, ladies and gentlemen, as we uh, get into this passage, I have uh, been with you long enough tonight. And I'm going to just leave you with this poem. One of my favorite poems on prayer. I learned it as a young Christian. That's the second poem. The second poem. And uh, this poem is by an unknown author. author. And I love it because it means so much. And when I was a young Christian, I didn't know it was based upon my favorite prayer verse. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Uh, I wish the person had put their name to this poem, but they really did something when they wrote this poem. And I want to leave it with you since it's already morning time for many of you. He or she said, I got up early one morning and rushed right into the day. I had so much to accomplish that I didn't have time to pray. <clears throat> have you ever been there? Problems just tumbled about me and heavier came each task. Why doesn't God help me? I wondered. He said, you didn't ask. I wanted to see joy and beauty, but the day toiled on and on, gray and bleak. I wondered why God didn't show me. He said, my child, but you didn't seek. I tried to come into God's presence. I used all of my keys at the lock. God gently and lovingly chided, my child, you didn't knock. I woke up early this morning and paused before entering the day. I had so much to accomplish that I had to take time to pray. Amen, somebody. Let's all stand for prayer. Holy Father God, we praise you and we thank you always for your holy word. And I thank you so much for allowing us to make it to this passage. Lord, only you know I may die before I finish this series all the way through the Bible. But I thank you for allowing us to make it to this passage because this is a pivotal passage in your holy word. It is life-changing. 
If every person in, under the sound of my voice right now would take heed to this passage, I'm talking to, I'm talking about your Christian people. It would change their lives forever. They will be different. <clears throat> and they will be victorious every day of their lives. So Lord, help them to take heed to it and help them to pray without ceasing, to rejoice always and to give thanks for this is your will for our lives. Save those who are lost and revive those who are saved. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and forsake. Amen. You may be seated. Now, dear friend of mine, whether you're in Zambia or South Africa or Ghana or France, or on the Isle of Patmos, wherever you are, I want you to know that God loves you, Jesus loves you, and by His grace we love you too. And so if you're with us tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, your first prayer needs to be what we call the sinner's prayer. First, Please understand that you are a sinner just as I am. I don't care where you are or who you are, or how rich you are, or how beautiful you might be. We're all sinners. We all have broken God's commandments and His laws. And the laws that are written down in our consciences, we know when we're wrong. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We all have failed God Almighty, our Maker. Secondly, accept the fact, dear friend, that there's a penalty for sin. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We die because of our sins. These big, beautiful unbelievable bodies the price or the worth of a human being is beyond measure you can't even begin to count it yet we are dying daily something went bad wrong we have failed God we have sinned against God we have disobeyed our maker so we die our bodies go to the grave our soul goes to hell or heaven if we trust Christ as Savior we go to heaven third dear friend accept the fact that you are on the road to hell right now if you have never trusted Christ as Savior Jesus Christ said in Matthew 10:28, and fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. We were created never to die, but we disobeyed God, the God who made us. Our loving God, we offended him. And we began to die. And if we don't trust Christ as Savior, uh, we will go to hell with the devil and his angels. Hell is a real place. Hell is just as real as New York City. Just because you have not been to New York City does not mean that New York City does not exist. Your unbelief will not change the fact that there's a hell. <clears throat> and hell is a bad place and hell is bad news, but I have some good news for you that Jesus talked about for the first time and uh, nobody can say it better than he has said it. For he said in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou you shall be saved. Just believe in your heart in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
that he died for your sins, was buried, and rose from the dead by the power of God for you, so that you can live forever with him. Pray and ask him to come into your heart to save your soul today, and he will save you. Romans 10, 9 and 13 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou you shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Saved from hell. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he suffered, bled, and died on the cross for your sins, was buried, and rose again from the dead, God will save your soul. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you want to trust Christ as Savior right now, this morning, wherever you are in the world, I'll be glad to lead you in prayer to help you come before the throne of grace and trust Christ as Savior. As somebody, someone led me so many years ago. Repeat after me phrase by phrase and mean it from your heart. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believing that he suffered and he bled and he died on the cross for your sins. Was buried and rose again. Repeat after me. Phrase by phrase. Holy Father God. I acknowledge that I am a sinner. And that I have done evil and wrong in your sight. Many times. I have broken your Ten Commandments. I have taken my sins too lightly. I have lied before. I have cheated before. I have stolen things before. I have dishonored my parents. I have taken your holy name in vain. I've lusted after people and things that don't belong to me. For Jesus Christ's sake, have mercy and grace upon my soul, and please forgive me of my sins. As I now believe with all of my heart in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins, was buried and rose again. Lord Jesus, please come into my heart and save my soul and change my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to repent of my sins past. Help me to turn from my evil ways and to follow you in the new life. In Jesus Christ's name I do pray and for his sake. Amen. Now, dear friend of mine, if you just trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you prayed that prayer and meant it from your heart, I declare to you that based upon the Word of God, you are now saved from hell and you are on your way to heaven. Welcome to the family of God. Congratulations on trusting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You have done the most important thing in life. For more information to help you grow in your newfound faith in Christ, go to GospelLightSociety.com and read my pamphlet, What to Do After You Enter Through the Door. Jesus Christ said in John 10, 9, I am the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture.